David Crosby, a founding member of the Birds and Crosby, Stills and Nash, has died, according to his representative. He was 81 years old. The reason of death has not been revealed. Those who followed his very active Twitter account, which he'd been tweeting on as recently as Wednesday, were taken aback by his death. Crosby's final tweet, the day before his death, was a typically witty remark about heaven. I heard the place is overrated, foggy. Former CSNY member Graham Nash, who had grown alienated from Crosby in recent years as their band split up, offered respect on social media. I learned with great regret that my buddy David Crosby has died, Nash wrote. I know people tend to focus on how volatile our relationship has been at times, but what has always mattered to David and me more than anything was the pure joy of the music we created together, the sound we discovered with one another, and the deep friendship we shared over all these many long years. David was bold in life and in music, Nash continued. He leaves a massive vacuum in terms of sheer personality and talent in this planet. He left a tremendous legacy by speaking his mind, heart, and love via his wonderful music. These are the most important things. My heart goes out to his wife, Jan, his son, Django, and all the people he has affected in this life. Eight months ago, Crosby made headlines when he claimed he was done performing live, claiming, I'm too old to do it anymore. I don't have the stamina or the strength. I've been making records at a frightening rate, he remarked. I'm 80 years old now, therefore, I'm going to die shortly. That's how it works. So I'm attempting to make as much music as I can, as long as it's extremely good. I've already got another one in the works. Crosby later changed his mind about doing concerts, declaring in mid-December that he'd changed his mind and anticipated to be out playing live again. Crosby had a significant comeback in 2019 with the theatrical documentary David Crosby. Remember My Name, narrated and produced by Cameron Crowe. Crosby discussed his own mortality in the film, and Crowe remarked on it in an interview with Variety, stating the singer was thinking about speaking the truth in my last huge interview that I'll probably ever do. He can write out with time is the last money in the second question of the first interview we had with Crosby. Crowe said, What do you do with the time you have left? What's nice is that he has more energy than any of us. He'll outlive all of us. He's batting his eyes like he's on his deathbed. He's not on his deathbed at all. Maybe it's all a ruse, as he implies in the end. You have no idea. Crosby, along with bandmates Roger McGinn, Gene Clark, Chris Hittleman, and Michael Clark, established the blueprint for 60s LA folk rock in the birds during his turbulent 1964-67 stint. Crosby formed CSNN with Stephen Stills of Buffalo Springfield and Graham Nash of the Hollies in the late 1960s, Laurel Canyon Milieu in Los Angeles, and their multi-platinum 1968 debut, heralded the age of rock supergroups. The addition of another volatile member, Stills' former Buffalo Springfield collaborator Neil Young, increased to the act's commercial luster. However, a continual clash of egos within Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, driven by the rock excesses of the day, brought the act to an end in the 1970s, though its members would reassemble sporadically over the years as a recording and touring ensemble. Crosby's most constant collaboration was with Nash, with whom he recorded and performed regularly into the new millennium. While he was never the primary songwriter of either The Birds or of CSN and Y, Crosby was an essential member of the richly layered Harmony front line that launched both acts several chart hits. He battled addiction for many years as the hedonistic epitome of the 1960s sex drugs and rock and roll lifestyle. His spectacular 1982 arrest in Texas on drug and weapons charges resulted in a five-month prison sentence in 1986. After years of cocaine and alcohol abuse, he underwent liver transplant surgery in 1994. Crosby never regained his early popularity, although he continued to record and perform handsomely into the 2000s. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame twice, once as a member of The Birds, 1991, and once as a member of Crosby's Stills and Nash, 1994, 1997. Crosby was a celebrity child. 
He was the son of Oscar-winning cinematographer Floyd Crosby, who worked on F. W. Murnau's 1931 movie Tabu. He was raised in Los Angeles and Santa Barbara, and was an uninterested student who gravitated to theater and music at a young age, after dropping out of Santa Barbara City College to pursue a career in music. He became immersed in the commercial folk music scene through a brief participation in Le Baxter's Balladeers, a lime leader styled in Summel, assembled by the well-known composer-arranger. His clear tenor voice drew the attention of Jim Dixon, the house engineer of Richard Bach's La label World Pacific Records, during his set at the Troubadour. Dixon began demoing Crosby as a solo artist, but those sessions eventually resulted in the establishment of a band. La's budding singer-songwriter scene was then centered on the folk den, the front room of the Troubadour, on Santa Monica Boulevard. One evening in 1964, the headstrong Crosby interjected himself into a jam session with two well-traveled young folk singers. McGinn, then known by his birth name, Jim, he shortly changed his name to Roger after embracing the spiritual movement Subud, had previously worked with the Limelitters and the Chad Mitchell Trio, and had met Crosby during the former act Santa Barbara tour stop. Clark had previously been a member of the new Christy Minstrels, another clean-cut folk ensemble. Though McGinn was apprehensive of Crosby's outsized, outspoken personality, he was swayed by the Beatles and envisioned the formation of a new group. Crosby's access to free studio time at World Pacific led to the initial sessions by McGinn, Crosby, and Clark under the collective moniker The Jet Set. The trio released a failed single on Elektra Records as The Beefeaters, but quickly reformed as a full-fledged rock quintet that reflected the influence of the Beatles' 1964 breakthrough feature, A Hard Day's Night. Chris Hillman, formerly mandolinist with the bluegrass-oriented World Pacific group The Hillman, and the inexperienced but handsome drummer Michael Clark were added to the roster. The act was signed to Columbia Records in late 1964 on the basis of promotional efforts by Dixon, who was now managing the band. Immediately, well-connected Dixon persuaded his act to record a new song written by one of his buddies, folk sensation Bob Dylan. The harmony-laden rendition of Dylan's Mr. Tambourine Man, released as the Bird's first single, Soared to Know, won on the U.S. singles chart in early 1965. The eponymous debut album, Peak at No. 6, because of a high-profile residency at Ciro's, the trio was the reigning attraction on Hollywood's Sunset Strip at the time. Crosby's trio would rule as American Pop's answer to the Beatles for the next two years, influencing a slew of similar folk rock outfits. During that time period, all of their Columbia albums charted in the top 25 in the United States. Though Crosby's clean, soaring voice was a vital component of the group's sound, he took a backseat as a composer to bandmates McGinn and Clark, who were responsible for the group's smash originals. Lady Friend and Why? both written by Crosby, failed to chart. Clark's departure from the Beatles in 1966 only served to intensify tensions between McGinn and Crosby. Strife within the Birds erupted in 1967. That June, the band performed at the landmark Monterey Pop Festival in Northern California. The band's politically outspoken Crosby irritated McGinn with some of his onstage remarks and further enraged his bandmate by sitting in with Buffalo Springfield for the majority of their set. McGuin banned the release of a new Crosby tune, Triad, depicting a sexual menage a trois. The song would eventually find a home on Crown of Creation, a 1968 album by Crosby's San Francisco friends Jefferson Airplane. Finally, in October 1967, McGinn and Hillman drove their Porsches to Crosby's Beverly Glen home and fired him from the birds. The newly cashiered Crosby began jamming with his friend Stephen Stills, whose lay-based band Buffalo Springfield had recently dissolved amid internecine turmoil, and Graham Nash, who met the other two during a 1966 U.S. tour by his Manchester, England bred group The Hollies. Crosby, Stills, and Nash were signed to Atlantic Records after a deal arranged by David Geffen liberated the three musicians from their outstanding contractual obligations. The group's self-titled album was released in May 1969, and it featured three notable Crosby compositions. The ballad, Guinevere, 
a love song inspired by his girlfriend Christine Hinton, and his ex-paramour Jimmy Mitchell, who had subsequently entered a relationship with Nash. The Apocalyptic Wooden Ships, co-written with Stills and Paul Kantner, and covered the same year by Kantner's group Jefferson Airplane. The harmonic album rose to no. Six on the U.S. chart and was eventually certified for four million copies sold. In August 1969, the group made their second concert appearance in front of 500,000 people at the Woodstock Music Festival in Bethel, New York, with new member Neil Young in tow. Young's inclusion to the lineup, now branded as Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, increased the group's already strong commercial clout. The Superstar Quartet's 1970 album, Deja Vu, soared to no. One and eventually sold 7 million copies. 1971's Four-Way Street, a two-LP live compilation derived from their subsequent U.S. tour, also earned the top spot and went quadruple platinum. Crosby's personal difficulties, meanwhile, worsened during the height of CSN and Y's prominence. He was already a heavy cocaine user, but after Hinton died in a vehicle accident in 1970, he switched to heroin. Though no stranger to drug usage, Young was shocked by Crosby's behavior and the ongoing tension and turmoil within the group, and withdrew to focus on his solo career, though he would return to tour with the other members in 1974. Despite his deteriorating condition, Crosby published his solo debut, If I Could Only Remember My Name, in 1971, which reached at no. 12. He garnered all-star support from Nash, Young, Joni Mitchell, and members of Jefferson Airplane, The Grateful Dead, and Santana. David Geffen organized a reunion of the original Birds lineup of Crosby, McGinn, Clark, Hillman, and Clark for his asylum label in 1972, and McGinn, who had led the act following Crosby's departure, disbanded the then-current version of the group. However, despite reaching no. 20 on the U.S. album chart in 1973, the collection was largely disregarded by critics, and the members went their separate ways. No new work was ever released under the bird's name. Through the 1970s, Graham Nash was Crosby's dependable partner, and stabilizing collaborator. They released the duet recordings Graham Nash slash David Crosby, No. 4, 1972, Wide on the Water, No. 6, 1975, and Whistling Down the Wire, No. 7, 1976, No. 26, 1976. However, the pair were odd men out in what began as a 1976 CSN and Y Studio reunion. Their vocals were removed from the record, which was released in 1976 as Long May You Run. Billed to the Stills Young Band, nonetheless, CSN was able to bury the hatchet long enough to record CSN, No. 2, 1977, and Daylight Again, No. 4, 1982. However, Crosby's personal life became highly public the year the second album was published. In April 1982, he was caught in a Dallas nightclub and charged with having a 45 caliber revolver and a pipe used to freebase cocaine. Convicted in 1983, he finally served five months of a five-year sentence in 1986, the year following another drunk driving arrest in Northern California. He eventually attributed his cocaine addiction to the Texas conviction. His run-ins with the law persisted in later years. In 2004, he was found guilty and punished for marijuana and guns possession. He hit a jogger with his automobile in Santa Inez, Calif, in 2015, but was not charged. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young reunited in 1985 for a farm aid performance. They headlined the Bridge School concert for the first of seven occasions in 1986. A fundraiser event arranged by Neil Young and his then-wife Piggy for a Northern California school serving disadvantaged children. Crosby continues his solo career with the albums Oh Yes I Can, No, 104, 1989, and Thousand Roads, No, 133, 1993. CPR, his most unique collaborative venture, was created in 1996 when he reunited with his son, pianist James Raymond who was born in 1962 
and given up for adoption by his mother following a brief connection with Crosby. From 1998 through 2001, the band, which comprised guitarist Jeff Pever, issued four independent albums. Crosby and Nash released a self-titled duo album in 2004, reaching no 142. Crosby returned to acting in the 1990s, appearing on The John Larroquette Show as the star's Alcoholics Anonymous sponsor and Roseanne, as well as in the films Hook and Thunderheart. He has appeared in two cartoon cameos on The Simpsons. He co-wrote two memoirs, Long Time Gone, 1988, and Since Then. How I Survived Everything and Lived to Tell About It, 1989, 2007. With David Bender, he released Stand and Be Counted, a history of activism in music in 2000. Crosby was active in the studio, recording six studio albums in the last decade as he talked about attempting to beat the clock. His final album, For Free, named after the Joni Mitchell song he performed, was published in July 2021. He has released live CDs like David Crosby and the Lighthouse Band Live at the Capitol Theater, which was released just over a month ago. Crosby is survived by his wife, Jan Dance, their son Django, son James Raymond, and two daughters from previous marriages, Erica and Donovan. Singer Melissa Etheridge announced in 2000 that Crosby was the biological father of two children born to Etheridge's then-partner Julie Cipher through artificial insemination. Beckett Cipher, one of Etheridge and Cipher's biological children, died of heroin addiction at the age of 21 in 2020. I didn't get to raise that kid, but he was here many times. Crosby stated after his death, I loved him, and he loved me, and he was like family to me. Crosby's final interview with Variety was a heartfelt, moving tribute to Jerry Garcia, published on the 25th anniversary of the Grateful Dead guitarist's death in August 2020. Of all the individuals that I can think of that I truly liked as artists, and then there are some stunners in there that I miss. I miss Jimi Hendrix, I miss Janis Joplin, I miss my friend Cass Elliot, I mourn a lot of people that I lost, yeah, I probably miss him the most. Crosby said, If I had to choose someone to represent musicians to the world and the universe, I would have chosen him. He was concerned with the proper things. He didn't play music for money. You could begin your list of Jerry Garcia facts with this. He wasn't there for the money. He didn't give a damn. He was looking for the notes. He was desperate for the music. He would go to tremendous lengths and suffer humiliations, laughs, to reach to the point where he could compose music. Crosby commented on how Garcia dragged him back into music after his sweetheart died unexpectedly prior to the recording of If I Could Only Remember My Name. I believe Garcia did me a favor on purpose. I think he realized I was in bad health and that the music was the only thing that was working. So he came in and just maxed it out. Just tell him I adore him. I adored him and will always love him in my heart. He was a fantastic man. Crow told Variety about his five favorite, undervalued David Crosby songs when their documentary was released in 2019. In a separate piece, Crow discussed working on the film with producer Greg Mariotti with the goal of preserving Crosby's legacy and personality for future generations of viewers. Years from now, aren't you going to be incredibly happy that you did this while Crosby was alive and wanted to do this project and was willing to talk? So we went all in and it became a feature that you always strive to get into a feature, which is that it transcended your initial objective and became an emotional thing. Among the many tributes to Crosby that came in after his passing, see that compilation here. One older one went viral among lovers of 1960s rock superstars. Crosby was a colorful and unpredictable guy, wore a mandrake the magician cloak, didn't get along with too many people, and had a great voice, an architect of harmony wrote Bob Dylan in his memoir Chronicles. He could freak out an entire city block by himself, but I liked him a lot. Crosby's final public statements on Wednesday, the day before he died, were a typical mix of things that characterized his musically and politically inclined feed. A slam against House Republicans Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene, and messages praising Greta Thunberg's activism and the supremacy of Paul McCartney's Eleanor Rigby.
If you like the video, don't forget to subscribe our channel. Thank you.